Hi everyone. I can see participants numbers are rising. That's great. That means we're being joined uh, by all the colleagues. We will give it a few more minutes, one or two, to make sure that everyone is able to join. And then we'll start. You can already see a lot of the participants from today's workshop joining, which is great. Welcome back. And there's also other people joining, which is great that the word got out about today's event. Great. Okay, I think at this point we are ready to start. Welcome everybody joining us today from all around the world to our first evening lecture of the TUMI Digital Summer School 2020. We're very excited to finish off today's day focused on the topic of e-mobility hubs by having an evening lecture with two distinguished speakers. Um, I want to take you first through our very short agenda. We try to keep it very straightforward. So I'm going to be talking just a little bit about housekeeping rules for this evening lecture. And I will, of course, introduce our speakers to you. And then without further ado, I'd already hand over to our expert presentations in order not to um, take too much time away from the Q&A that will follow just afterwards. In terms of housekeeping, because uh, this is going to be probably a much bigger round than we had in the working sessions today, I would uh, just like to ask you to stay muted throughout the session. You can use either the chat pane or the questions pane that you see um, on your dashboard in order to write down any of the questions you have. Feel free to write them down even as our experts are speaking. We will be collecting them and then we will do a Q&A session at the end of both presentations. So feel free to just write down whatever comes to your mind or whatever you would like to discuss further. Um, and just so you're aware, this session is being recorded and we will make it available afterwards. So even if you're only able to join for a small period of time, or if you have some colleagues and friends you would like to share this evening lecture with, then do feel free to uh, direct them to the Tumi YouTube channel and there they can follow um, the evening lecture even afterwards. Today with me are two e-mobility hub experts. I'm very excited about their inputs and the knowledge they will be talking to you about today. So for one, we have with us Angelo Meulemann. He's project director of shared and connected transport at Taxi Stop. And Angelo, since 2007, has been passionate to maximize the benefits of shared mobility. He's working in cities and regions, um, and he's working also in several EU programs to create public and political awareness about shared mobility as a building block for livable and resilient cities. In Belgium, he's one of the co-founders of Mobipunt VZW, an association that promotes the concept of MobiHubs, a local hub with at least shared mobility, collective transport, and bike facilities for urban, peri-urban, and rural areas. So he's going to be well equipped to talk to you about any issues around mobility hubs and the connection of various areas within your city and region. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we also have with us Rebecca Kabama from the city of Bremen. She's the sustainable mobility coordinator for the city. And she's also what we like to call an urbanite. She's passionate about creating sustainable, livable and socially equitable cities. As a sustainable mobility project coordinator for the city of Bremen, for the city of Bremen's Ministry for Climate Protection, the Environment, Mobility, Urban and Housing Development, she's responsible for implementing Bremen's car sharing action plan and coordinating various European transport projects. Currently, she's uh, coordinating an interreg North Sea region project 
is all about shared mobility and it's called Share North. So I'm sure we'll be hearing um, more about these projects that they are working on in their presentations. So without further ado, Angelo, I would like to hand over the word to you. You should now be able to share your screen and uh, put up your presentation. And uh, we're very excited to hear what you have to tell us about your experience. So thank you very much for introducing me. So, so now you see my screen. So I'm at the summer school um, of the Tumi workshop. So thank you very much. And I'm really happy to be in Lviv again. So I've heard that the summer school was supposed to be in Lviv. And it's my second time already in Lviv. Uh, I was there, I think in 2016, not really for my work. I was watching my football team losing with 5-0 uh, to a Ukrainian team. And to see uh, in the theater, the Swans Lake uh, from Tchaikovsky. So it's that's not important, but I was in Lviv already. But I took a picture at that moment, uh, not knowing that I would go back to Lviv once. In this picture, you can see what people are drawing about the dreams of Lviv. And I don't know about who has made this painting, but everywhere you see the same. You see a painting about uh, flowers, sun, a beautiful weather, bicycles, but you don't ever see um, cars uh, or not so much. And this is really, um, this workshop, I, I, I think the participants are coming from everywhere and we all have like a common dream about how cities should be like. And a city for people, not for cars. And that's what I discovered in 2016 in Lviv also. So I'm really happy to be in Lviv again. Um, I'm working for an NGO in Belgium called Taxi Stop. Uh, we have nothing to do with taxis, but we started many years ago to organize uh, hitchhiking. Um, now we are doing much more. It's about more efficient transport uh, by sharing and connecting different modes. We do it with car, uh, concrete solutions, a carpool app, we are a shareholder of car sharing, also an on-demand transport service for elderly. We work on innovation uh, and on awareness. So that's my job. I'm project director for shared and connected transport in the NGO, Belgian NGO called Taxi Stop. So one of the things we want to do in Taxi Stop, we want to have a more livable society. We want to do it by sharing, offering sharing modes, shared modes. Um, one of the services we have is the Cambio car sharing service in Bel Belgium. It's a station-based service. So people can pick up a car at a certain place, at the hub or at a car sharing place. We do it together with public transport operators. They are the other shareholders. And what we see um, from our sh um, service is that people, since they became member of the Cambio uh, car sharing service, they are using much more public transport. Um, they are mo using much more trains. Right? Uh, they are cycling much more in the city or towards the city, walking more, and, of, and there's a reduction in car usage. So we offer cars. But what we want to achieve is uh, less car usage uh, and ownership. And the ownership, uh, we have measured that one shared car is used by 28 users. And so it's uh, replacing many, many cars in the city. So giving the city back uh, to for other things, to people, to, to local economy, et cetera. So today in Belgium, because of our service, we have almost 20,000 cars less in Belgium. So this is what we have achieved so far. Um, yes, sorry, I just lost my presentation. Um, in a study recently uh, about Europe, we saw that from PricewaterhouseCoopers in 2017, we saw that uh, I, we have read in the study that uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers predicts to have 80 million cars less in Europe in 2030. So as taxi stop, we are really happy. This is a dream for our NGO. So we are going from 280 million cars to 200 million cars. But at the same time, in this study, we see that traffic will still rise because shared cars will be used more often. This is happening in some states in the United States, for example. But this is not our dream. So we were thinking, how can we 
have a future with fewer cars in the cities, but also uh, more usage of bicycles and walking. And we believe that sharing is not the only thing, but uh, connecting it to sustainable modes, walking, cycling, public transport. So th in this study, we have learned what we should do. And our answer on that is the story of the Mobi hubs, mobility hubs. Um, that's that's our story. So why we want to promote this concept of mobility hubs. One place with several modes, services and experiences. So we started to promote this ID already in 2017. Uh, and in this picture, you can see a picture from a mobile pump in Bremen. So you will see that later on in the presentation of Rebecca. We started to promote this ID in Belgium, for, inspired by the city of Bremen. And a couple of months later, there was the first hub, a mobile pump in Danze, a small city, 50,000 inhabitants. So the story started in 2018. Um, after promoting this concept, uh, many years, uh, one year later, two years later, already 50 municipalities in Flanders were co-working with us to create mobility hubs. We started to create a memorandum. In our memorandum, we said we asked our government a new political, a new government to create a budget and a policy for 1,000 mobility hubs. So this is what we achieved in 2018 and 2019, and the Flemish government, they were really uh, enthusiastic about our ID and they integrated this idea of mobility hubs in their new transport plan. And then in, in the, this transport plan, they are talking about four layers uh, of, of organizing transport, public transport, the train net, the core bus network, then the complementary bus network, and then at the lowest layer, there's the on-demand tailor-made uh, network for specific target groups but also for local uh, transportation and for them uh, for the flemish government the mobile hubs are connecting the lower layers the connection between buses and on demand transport or shared modes bike sharing car sharing so it became part of the flemish policy um and that's, th this was really important for us it's, it really gave uh, credits to our idea of mobility hubs um so then Recently, in July, uh, our new Flemish minister, she declared to create a budget, and this was huge, never expected by us, of plus 100 million euros to create 1,000 Mobi hubs. So this was, was our ambitious idea. Sometimes as NGO, you dream and you just share your dream, but she made it reality. She created a budget for that. But she, she changed the name into hop-in points. Okay, that was okay, it's just the name. Um, so that was what we achieved in those last three years. Um, so we started in 2017 with a simple idea, MobiPunt, simple and MobiPunt for us definition was shared mobility together with public transport, with bicycle facilities and certain criteria about accessibility. If you combine that, you can call it MobiPunt. It was our own name, brand protected. But if you want to use the name, it was for free, but you just had to uh, take into account those different criteria. Later on, uh, by negotiating with shareholders, with the public transport operators, several municipalities and cities, we made the distinction between proximity hubs, like neighborhood hubs, where access, having access to certain modes is more important, and then network hubs, and there is switching from one mode to another mode is more important. So that's the definition of mobility hubs. And from the beginning, we started to communicate, okay, it's uh, it's more than those basic criteria. It can be much more like a carpool stop, like for business parks, for instance, or a bicycle pump, or maybe information about walking uh, routes, EV charging, um, that could be a package wall for e-commerce, for instance. So many ideas, practical things, but also about experience. Not only useful things, but like um, adding some fitness gear uh, equipment. So why not? Or making just just making things for kids. For kids, it's not useful, but kids just like it. So so it's about the practical um, things and the experience. And okay, we started to promote this idea together. With, you can see those logos uh, downsides with. Um, three different NGOs, the car sharing association called autodealing.net, 
TaxiStop en Infopump publiek, publieke ruimte, hoe is een NGO promoting better um, public space. We uh, together we created the MobiHub NGO with a mission uh, to make transport more sustainable and accessible. Really simple, by creating those hubs. It's the, our mission is to make uh, transport more sustainable and accessible. So our idea was to have 1000 mobility hubs in Flanders uh, and every hub should become stronger because of the network. So it was not only about uh, consulting municipalities to have a really perfect hub, but now we, our focus was more on the network. Every hub is stronger when it's part of a network. So this is what we are doing now. So we are working on a network. Um, we have a learning network. There's so much, still so much to learn because it's a new concept. So we organize webinars, uh, a MobiHub Academy. We, do, we are doing this together with Rebecca from Bremen. So now you, in this uh, slide, you can see a picture from people from Flanders. We were going together to the city of Bergen in Norway um, to visit those mobility hubs, but to learn from each other, from, from workshop organized by Rebecca, from people from Bremen and from us. Um, also by, par uh, by partnerships with the transport regions of Flanders and something else and maybe if you are interested uh, we created also a Moby pub game um, and this is just to launch the idea for different stakeholders what could it be a mobility hub being creative learning but just by having fun also so if you are ever interested in organizing this to create to create some buzz about this idea in your organization just give us a call um, the network is not only, uh, it's about learning network, but also to create something visible, something we really learned from Bremen. Uh, I was already working together with the city of Bremen since 2008, but it took like 10 years for me to really understand the power of having a brand for it, something clear, a landmark in the streets. Um, so I've learned from the mobile punk that this was really important. So we, we, we have chosen for a name called Mobipunt, uh, but giving, a, a visual, giving it a visual identity and in every municipality the same. So it, it's, that's really, we started to promote this in Flanders from the beginning, create a uniform brand for, the, for everyone because traveling is per definition something going from one area to another area. So it makes sense to give it, give it one name. And giving it a clear name, like, like the word, word Mobipunt was a new name. It's just creating a new word um, is, creates a reflex for city developers to start uh, planning a mobility hub already in designing process for transport planners, urban planners. So this, this name is so important. Um, we are working on the digital network also. Uh, this is the MobiHub database. We are still fine-tuning it uh, with uh, using an API, which is used already in the Netherlands also. Uh, a dashboard for municipality to measure the impact and the usage about the mobility hubs. And of course, I, for us, it makes sense to, to do that in a network because uh, asking every municipality or city to create an all digital platform is just a waste of money. Just let's combine it for everyone together. And also a kiosk application for a digital builder to offer the right information to our users. Um, the fourth network, uh, those are some pictures from the kiosk screen on the digital player, you will see it later. So information about public transport, about what is it, the mobility hub, also a, a local map uh, which uh, serves the odd walking distance, etc. This is the kiosk screen. Uh, of course, it's also a functional network. Uh, this is more a story about intermodality. So you can go, you can use, a, we are partner of the car sharing company in Belgium with cars all over the country. So we promote for them to take a, a train in Ghent, go by train to Antwerp and in Antwerp for the last mile, you might use a shared bike or maybe a shared car. If you combine it, then it's a seamless uh, transport uh, journey and this makes sense. So you have to make it functional. It's for intermodal journeys, but also for EV charging, of course. For EV charge, charging, you need to charge your car sometimes at your workplace, sometimes, sometimes where you live, but also sometimes when you're traveling. And the more uh, charging in, uh, infrastructure you have, 
the more reliable it becomes to have an electric car, of course. So, um, in this picture, we are doing this now, create, promoting the concept of mobility app since two years. Um, the first year, it was more like quick wins. Um, the first mobility hubs were not the best hubs, and still we don't have the best hubs, but we are already creating hubs, and every hub becomes stronger, and it's always a start of a process. So we create a hub with a branding, with a name, and later on we add services. Um, so if you now will visit Flanders, maybe you won't see the best mobility hubs, but we are really in the start to create this network, and Leuven is an example of that. We started uh, this weekend. The first mobility hubs were launched with a new hop in branding. Um, the city of Leuven, they combine bike sharing and car sharing with electric cars, with electric bikes also, cargo bikes. Um, they started already drawing a network of 50 hubs. So the, most of them are proximity hubs, neighborhood hubs. They have chosen to not uh, at scooter sharing. In bigger cities, it makes sense to have uh, scooter sharing, um, that kind of more micro mobility service. For Leuven, which is rather a small city, they have the focus on walking and cycling. Most people are just having a bicycle, so it doesn't make sense to add public space for that. So there's no scooter sharing in that. Something they did last weekend, uh, it was the inauguration of the first mobility hub in the Hopin style. So it was really ceremonial something we have learned from Bremen also. Give, create some buzz if you open it. The minister was there, the, the mayor of Leuven was there. Um, so And they combine electric and non-electric modes. In St. Levens Hautem, you I think you have never heard about the place called St. Levens Hautem. St. Levens Hautem is a really small municipality, um, rural, rather rural. So in there, well, it's like 5,000 inhabitants. So now they have also a mobility hub this was launched in July or, or in spring um, with EV car sharing, EV bike sharing um, and something they add uh, was walking and cycling routes also for leisure, for recreational usage. So um, they, they create this place as this, the central hub for touristical information also. And of course, they are become strong because they are not doing it alone, but it's a part of a network of new mobility hubs of 90 municipalities with support of the province. And now, to the, um, oh, this is a, a screen from this digital, digital pillar. So, the St. Levens Hautem is a small village over here. They don't have a train station, but they give information for, train, uh, for the local inhabitants about where are the train stations and also real-time train information. Also information about electric cars, you can see that on the screens. And this is the tailor-made information from this municipality about nature, uh, walking in nature, walking with kids, etc., cycling. So this is what we are doing in St. Levens Hartem. And now I added a slide also about Groningen Drenthe. This is outside my own country, it's in the Netherlands. Um, but I'm, I'm currently in the Netherlands, in Groningen, Drenthe. Um, I'm here to learn more. Uh, today I'm doing a study tour um, to learn more about the hubs project over uh, over here. So, and Groningen, Drenthe is a region with one city, Groningen, and all the other cities are much smaller. So most people are going to Groningen. Um, and they're working together with two provinces to make public transport as attractive as possible. So we as a shared mobility operator, we started from more from the perspective of offering shared mobility and combining it with other modes. Here in uh, Groningen Drenthe, they started more, what, how can we make public transport more accessible and even more cost efficient? So um, this is the beginning point of this initiative over here. So now we have more like more, more than 50 hubs with their own branding in uh, those provinces and from every village um, people can use a bicycle to go to the hub or elderly people or people with reduced mobility can use the hub taxi to go to the hub and then they can go they can take public transport with a very good quality public transport so i was impressed today about how it how it is organized i even saw today a charging station for buses it takes five minutes 
to charge an electric bus uh, and then okay it's not for the whole day but it's enough for the uh, for the next journey for this bus so i i was impressed about that also and i really believe still believe that uh, investing in electric mobility makes more sense if you invest it in electric public transport from the beginning um and yeah they have the idea also to to create a network uh, and what I've learned today is, okay, they have also the, the branding, the hub branding, but the story from today, we I saw like 15 hubs today, but every hub is different. It's tailor-made. Sometimes you have a public library. And if you combine a public library with mobility services, then, okay, it's it's a different story than in uh, an area where it's more like a park and ride. So it's both are a hub, but the circumstances, the local situation is different. So, and, and you have to, you cannot make like uh, something that fits for every, every neighborhood. The tailor-made work is really important, even if you make one common branding. So um, this workshop today is about electric vehicles so i had to add the slide about electric cars also and we, we as taxi stop really believe that we are enthusiastic about those electric cars because we really believe that clean air was important in cities and outside cities also also the noise is important and we have I, we see it in flanders that we the increase of electric cars is in flanders mainly about electric shared cars it's really like a showroom for people to test it to see it in the streets so it's important to have as many electric cars as possible in the shared fleets also. But also, um, what I know from the operator perspective uh, and being in the market already for many years before the rise of the electric cars, uh, if you wait until you can have electric cars everywhere, everywhere it slows down your, uh, your growth of your organization, of your fleet. And uh, for us, it's more important to have shared cars than to have electric cars. So the shared sharing is more important. So if you can have the same speed and growth with electric cars, it's good. But uh, you have to choose for sharing first and then maybe electric. And also from the user point of perspective, uh, from the user perspective, sorry, um, we know that a mixed fleet is important because we want to offer so mobility solution solutions as an alternative for car ownership because we know that if people have a car it's a reflex of that they use the car so you have to give a reliable alternative and if you have a fleet with one type of cars often smaller cars for urban uh, transportation then maybe people still need a car to go to the country's countryside and to go to the a recycling park etc but if they still need the car for those journeys they won't get rid of their own car they keep their own car and then they they will keep the reflex of car usage so it's okay to have electric cars but be ready that you have a mixed fleet of cars for every purpose uh, of journey um, bigger cars also um and uh, my final slide so we are doing this, promoting this idea of mobility apps since 2017. We have learned many lessons already. And the main lessons we have learned is, I said it already, is the power of a word for it. So if you start in your city, uh, start from the beginning with a name for it. Don't make it complex or sexy, just give it an understandable name for everyone. And then people will start to talk about it. Developers will start to integrate it in their plans. So this is very important. Uh, what we have learned also in the beginning, we were really ambitious. Uh, so we every mobility hub should have public transport and shared mobility and bicycle facilities. But we became more pragmatic uh, and being ambitious is still important, ambitious in terms of sustainability and livability. But okay, sometimes you have to be pragmatic also. That's what we have learned from stakeholders everywhere, but also from the local stakeholders, the neighborhood, as from the uh, developer side, from the operator side. And the, the, the last lesson we have learned, which is confirmed always, is 
the network thinking, one plus one is three. We really believe that every hub becomes stronger if it's part of a network. But also what we believe is that uh, the work we are doing, you can see the logos downstairs, uh, to add the, the power of different NGOs or municipalities operates to talk to different uh, stakeholders to create those hubs. We have learned a lot from other countries, also from the city of Bremen, from the city of Bergen through the Share Nord project. So if you start with the ID, start to talk with other organizations also, start to listen, uh, and then it becomes much stronger. So this is what we have learned in those last three years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelo. I think that was an uh, amazing input, and I think we learned a lot about already the importance of networks, which I think is something that we will come back to in the Q&A session, because uh, up until now, today, we've only just looked at the individual mobility hub. Um, and as I can see that there's already some questions incoming, that's great, please keep them coming. Um, but I will save them for after we have had Rebecca's presentation who I would like to hand over to now. Becca, I'm giving you uh, the moderator key, so you should be able to share your screen. Um, by the way, one person applause for Angelo. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure the rest is applauding, applauding as well. <laughs> um, I mean, there we go, I'm just sharing my screen now. Lena, is everything, can you see everything as, as it's intended to, no navigation in the background? Perfect, everything looks great. Okay, super. Uh, well, thanks uh, very much. It's a really pleasure to be here. And um, thank you to Angelo definitely for a um, great introduction of the concept of mobility hubs again, and also the shout out to Bremen several times. Um, it's also always been a pleasure working together with um, TaxiStop and Autodeon.net and we had no idea when we did a joint workshop in 2017 that an idea from the city of Bremen would take flight um, and become so powerful um, all throughout uh, Flanders and, and even further. That just shows what um, what I, an idea can, can spur or can do uh, when passionate people talk and talk and talk about it and are convinced that it's, um, it's something worth, well, worth fighting for as well. Um, so I'd like to share um, really concrete examples um, now from just one municipality, the city of, of Bremen in northern Germany, um, based on our 17 years of experience with planning mobility hubs. So, oops. in case you are not familiar with the city of Bremen, we are located in northern Germany, just off the coast of the North Sea, uh, 60 kilometers inland. And it's, very, it's a compact city. We are known for UNESCO World Cultural Heritage, and maybe you've heard of the um, fairy tale of the Bremen Town Musicians. Um, but maybe you've also heard of, of some mobility plans uh, in Bremen. So a compact city structure really influences our modal split uh, in the city, where only 36% of daily trips are done by using a car. That means the rest are done by walking, cycling, and public transport. And oh yes, by the way, size. Um, so you know roughly the size of, of Bremen, um, 567,000 inhabitants um, approximately. So about twice the size of the city where uh, Angelo is from, or a little bit more. Um, and like uh, Angelo mentioned as well, um, cities are built for people. And that's the same way that uh, Bremen was built. Um, obviously the medieval city center and also the, the neighborhoods developed uh, later on in the centuries were designed for people. Um, roads were intended as access to homes and businesses and for places for children to play um, and so on, as you can see here. However, 100 years later, a little bit over 100 years later, this is what the same street looks like. And this is a challenge that many cities are facing um, around the world and certainly in, in Europe. And so that public space and those access roads used now primarily for storing private property and the private property happens to be some bit of metal on wheels those cars that are in use less than one hour a day and take up 100 percent of the space entire day 
And this is a situation that has been tolerated in Bremen for a long time now, since the 1960s. And it's a huge problem um, in our neighborhoods. It's a safety issue, it's accessibility issue, it's um, quality of life, and it's expensive uh, for the city to, to manage. And um, up until recently, there was also lack of political will to, um, yeah, to implement hard measures against um, the number of cars in the city and illegal parking. Um, now that is slowly changing the political landscape. So our, um, we're starting to work with the stick as well as the carrot. But um, the carrot is something we've been working with since 2003 with our mobility hubs. So the question is why why does the city plan mobility hubs for for um, you know mobility service providers? And it's because we want to improve the resource and space efficiency in our cities. We want to reduce um, transport related um, emissions, not only greenhouse gas emissions, but you know nitrogen oxides, um, emissions that affect public health. We want to create more socially inclusive and accessible public spaces for people of all ages and all abilities. And we want to improve the quality of life in cities and regain that space from cars for, for people and for other purposes. And that's why um, Bremen um, implemented a or voted on a car sharing action plan in 2009 already and integrated car sharing into an action plan as well as our sustainable urban mobility plan. And of those, those measures and the targets we set, um, implementing car sharing stations or mobility hubs on public street space was one of those aspects. And say, well, why is that? It's because of the, the impact um, that car sharing has. Um, Angelo already mentioned this as well, that um, the impact that car sharing has on private car ownership. And in a study we did here in Bremen, uh, we were able to determine that one car sharing vehicle replaces 16 privately owned cars. So that shows that car sharing is one way to tackle that problem of too many cars in the city with the space available and also justifies um, our, um, our actions as a, as a city it's, um, or legitimizes our uh, action in the city. And at the time of the study, um, now we're nearing 20,000 users, um, we'd already been able to get over five and a half thousand cars off the street. Another reason why we promote mobility stations and car sharing is because we know it has a positive impact on mobility behavior. Um, that car sharing users use sustainable transport modes much more often than the average car owner for trips to work and school and for shopping and for free time. So, so there's environmental benefits that Angelo also mentioned. Other reasons there are environmental benefits is um, that users are able to choose the appropriate car for the journey. So downsizing or um, choosing a larger vehicle, but then only taking one trip uh, for that necessary journey. And um, the vehicles in the fleet tend to be of a better emission standards. Their fleets are renewed more often and sometimes include um, electric vehicles. So it's simply on having that mixed fleet, as Angela mentioned, already has massive benefits um, for the environment and, and air quality. Right, so um, in Bremen, more, there are more than 100 car sharing stations. And of those 100, about one third are mobility stations. So those are hubs um, that have been planned by the city. And our goal as a city is to reduce the distance between each um, car share station and hub to a maximum of 300 meters. Um, that's also kind of the psychological barrier of um, um, that people are willing to walk to the next public transport station. It's similar for car sharing. So if one station is fully booked, that is the um, maximum distance that uh, users are willing to walk or cycle in order to um, you know, get a vehicle. After that, it's the service is not attractive anymore. And of those one third, um, we have two types of, of mobility stations. Um, Angelo named them as um, proximity and network hubs. Um, the Mobilpunkte um, would be those network hubs. These are larger um, stations 
with four to 12 car sharing vehicles that are linked to public transport, to taxis, um, to other mobility services or other neighborhood services like recycling facilities. They always include bicycle parking. They're always at um, highly accessible and, and visible locations and always with really clear branding um, with the mobile pump. So if you remember the photo that you saw in Angela's presentation, that was taken from a different angle, but it's the same, same station. But so we started with the large hubs in 2003, and in 2013, we started expanding with those proximity hubs, so those neighborhood hubs, and we call them mobile Pünktchen. They feature two to three car sharing vehicles, uh, and a few smaller elements um, like bicycle parking, accessible, but always still with that clear, visible branding and um, easily accessible site in the neighborhood. So not in back lots, um, not in, in underground parking garages, but really in this visible, easily accessible um, space, which draws it into the public awareness and also makes it just as attractive or even more attractive um, as the privately owned car. So um, just so you know about the size at the moment, we have 43 uh, mobility hubs uh, in Bremen and only 10 of those are these large um, network hubs. Um, most of them are these small proximity hubs um, where the journey starts um, for our users. But in Bremen, the Mobilpunkt and Mobilpunkt are more than a mobility station and more certainly more than a car sharing station. To us, it's also about placemaking. And um, when we design every hub, as Angela mentioned his experience here in the Netherlands, um, every hub is designed to meet the needs of the neighborhood. And sometimes those needs are um, infrastructure improvements that are required um, that allows us to improve you know, safety and accessibility in the neighborhood and also acceptance um, for, for these hubs because you know, quite often experiences is that we, if we go in to plan a hub, we are, the perception in the neighborhood is that we are taking something away from them um, by providing, you know, taking parking spaces away from them. By providing the services and additional um, infrastructure improvements, we are giving something back to the neighborhood as well. Um, we also focus on improving accessibility um, and barrier-free access in neighborhoods for people with um, physical and, and um, visual impairments. Something as simple as you know, redesigning an intersection and including tactile elements can already make um, a neighborhood safer and more accessible for people with special needs. Um, we're improving accessibility in neighborhoods for our friends in the big red and big white trucks um, who have to maneuver through narrow um, urban streets every single day. So something basic um, as just changing infrastructure so that uh, illegal parking at intersections is no longer possible. And we also try to integrate aspects of you know, climate adaptation. Um, Bremen, due to climate change, will see a lot more heavy rainwater events. So um, even something as simple as the paving we use um, or lack of paving um, and more green space contributes to uh, making our city a bit more um, yeah, resilient and adaptive. And um, I mentioned that that um, proximity uh, to stations in that in the survey we did a few years ago, and we asked the users, um, you know, what was most important for them to be satisfied with um, the car share mobility services, and they said that the short distance to the next station is one of the three most important criteria, and. While the other two aspects, so uncomplicated booking and vehicle availability, are um, issues that providers deal with, we as a city can influence network density, so distance of um, stations. And um, the users, when asked how satisfied they were with it, um, were quite satisfied with, with the distance to the next station. So we get some validation that we're doing um, a good job in that city. And um, just on a side note, um, we also looked at um, the gender differences um, of aspects that are important to men and women. And it was more important to, to women that um, there's, it's a short distance to the next station 
and that um, stations are in you know visible in the public realm. So we know that uh, the mobility hubs can also contribute to um, gender mainstreaming that public realm, so making it more um, safer and more accessible for female users. And now um, you're probably asking yourself, what does this have to do with e-mobility? Um, I'll get to the point now. Um, we obviously um, try to integrate electric mobility into the mobility hubs as well. However, it is not our primary focus. Um, as Angelo said, um, a shared car is always, you know, is that's more important than the electric car. And the shared electric car is is you know, one of those um, added benefits, but we don't make it um, a requirement for for our providers. Um, so I'll, get, I'll tell you for uh, why in a second. Um, but we do have a few mobility hubs that f feature charging facilities um, for electric vehicles. Um, also in a model where the energy provider has one access point for the car share vehicle and then one publicly accessible um, uh, charging point, which um, creates also a better business case for the um, energy provider. And for all those hubs where we don't have um, charging infrastructure installed, we create space for it. Um, so, so this is something um, it's you know in the, the yeah that's circled circled in red. Um, that is a space that is reserved for charging infrastructure, and we already have the underground um, pipes and um, yeah electricity supply should should it be needed. Um, here's another example. Um, as you can also see, we're also using the same car share logo that's used in, in the Netherlands and in Flanders. And the reason why we don't require um, car share user or car share providers to um, provide electric mobility is because of the the market situation. Um, I've just quickly put together um, uh, an overview. So in in Bremen, there are a bit more than 400 um, car sharing vehicles at the moment. Um, of those, uh, most of them are conventionally fueled. About two thirds are probably with gasoline, and one third. Uh, with diesel. Um, of those 400, um, there are 10 hybrid uh, car share vehicles and 14 electric vehicles. And I say, well, that's not a lot. Um, but it, it is indeed um, quite a challenge for the car share providers um, with electric mobility, at least on the German market, um, for a number of reasons. In Germany, it is more expensive to purchase an electric vehicle, and it is more expensive for the car share providers to maintain um, those electric vehicles. And at the same time, there's not yet um, a high enough demand for um, or from the users for electric vehicles. So it makes it a really difficult business case um, for the car share provider. Um, we as a city were interested in having reliable um, and functioning car sharing services rather than experimental services. And I already mentioned that um, car sharing in general, no matter what type of um, uh, propulsion um, or fuel is used for the propulsion, already has significant positive impacts on um, emissions in the cities and car, um, car ownership in the cities. Um, compared to to private ownership, so um, electric mobility is something that's important and it's a, a nice to have. Um, but our main concern is not to have electric mobility if it doesn't work um, in a business case setting and if it doesn't work um, as as a system. So as part of a, a mixed fleet, electric mobility makes sense. Um, but the uh, car share providers that we have had the experience of working with that only have electric vehicles don't offer the type of flexibility that users are currently looking for. So like Angela mentioned, you know, that long weekend trip um, or that trip uh, to, to transport a lot of cargo. And um, in a recent study done by the German Car Share Association about hurdles for non-users to start using car sharing, um, one of the biggest hurdles uh, for non-users to use car sharing is that they think it's complicated. It doesn't mean it's complicated, but they think it's complicated. And adding um, 
electro Kaohsiung adds that perception of it being extra complicated. What do I do with the plug? Can I reach my can I reach my um, destination without having to charge? Where do I charge? How does that work? Um, it's something that perception, and this is we also get this back from the um, car share providers. It's that perception that something is complicated that keeps users from demanding um, service. So um, it will take time. We'll be patient, but it's not our main focus um, as a city. Um, in uh, the city of Bergen in Norway, um, Angelo mentioned here, they're also a Share North project partner. Things are a little bit different, um, or a lot different, I would say, with regard to electric mobility. So in the Mobilpunkte, um, the mobility hubs that the city of Bergen plans, they're planned entirely for electric car share vehicles. And um, this is a picture of the very first uh, mobility hub that Bergen opened, um, also under the brand name Mobilpunkt, which in Bremen we're obviously very proud of. Um, it features parking base for nine car share vehicles um, and electric car share vehicles. And it's been really successful in Bergen. Um, but the market and the user behavior in Norway is very different to, to that in Germany. Um, more than, yeah, 50% of new cars bought in Norway are um, electric, and the purchase of an electric vehicle is less expensive than the purchase of a conventional vehicle. So it's a different market case, and the users are different, are used to uh, driving electric cars uh, mostly. However, um, I would still hypothesize that um, the electric vehicles there are not used for long distance journeys. And that uh, users use car or have, yeah, have regular long distance journeys still have a conventionally fueled car, maybe for that trip to the cabin. Um, but we're still waiting to do some research on that. But uh, at least here in Norway, electric car sharing and the mobility hubs with EVs have been very successful. So I'm almost finished. Uh, last point. So the benefits of mobility hubs, um, Angela already also mentioned, is that increased vis visibility and accessibility of shared um, and sustainable transport because we've we draw it into the public realm public awareness and a specific extra the political awareness as well um, mobility hubs allow neighborhoods and cities to create tailored solutions to meet the needs of their communities and to support those sustainable transport policies and the joint branding um, really rallies together the forces of, of planners and politicians and creates that extra bit of, of visibility that's important but when you're planning a mobility hub, there are lots of aspects to you know consider when selecting a site. You know, really down to that finest detail of you know where's where's you know where are there gaps in the network? How accessible is it? Um, what services do you want to provide? And what what are the users around? But I think one of the most important questions um, for us that we ask in Bremen, and um, I advise all cities who are planning mobility hubs to ask is what do you want to achieve? And is mobility hub the right tool to achieve that goal? And for me, that same question needs to be posed with regard to electric mobility. What do you want to achieve with electric mobility? And is electric mobility the right, right way to achieve that goal? So some food for thought for the discussion. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I think that was very enlightening in terms of also giving us a bit of an input on, um, first of all, how Bremen evolved as a city uh, and how the issue of cars kind of took over uh, city development. Uh, and then also, like you said, giving us some food for thought about technology um, selection, also grounding it quite well in, you know, why it might be sometimes uh, more difficult to go for an e-mobility solution straight away. Um, but that it's always good to prepare for future uh, cases where that might be a helpful solution. So let me just go back to uh, my screen. Um, I'm not able to share it with you full screen. I'm very sorry about that because I do have to look into our question panel, which I'm otherwise not able to see in order to direct some of your questions towards our speakers. So I, I will try to sort of guess who they might be directed to, but uh, please, Rebecca and Angelo, feel free to answer or give an input if you have anything to say on the topics. 
So the first question that we received actually resonated also with one that came a bit later and that I think Rebecca just now answered in quite detail. Um, and the question was, how did you select the locations for the hubs? And the later question um, put in the question of what are the criteria for selecting mobility hubs? So maybe Angelo, um, looking back to the points that Rebecca also just mentioned uh, for site selection, uh, when you were creating your network, what were some of the criteria on how you chose where the individual points should end up? Are you still with us? Oh, oh you're muted, sorry. Yes, mute. yeah. <laughs> so we don't have strict criteria for uh, selecting those hubs. Often it's like very obvious when you have to plan it or sometimes there's an opportunity. Like the first mobility hub was probably in terms of transport, not the best location. It was in a, in a city called Deense. They have chosen to create the mobility hub uh, near the new uh, city hall. And that was a very good option because there was close to many different services. But in terms of transport, the next bus stop was 200 meters further. So. Was it a good choice? I don't know, but sometimes it's a, it's a choice, like talk, see what the opportunities are. Of course, if it's a network uh, hub, then the seamless switch from one mode to another mode, close to, to a metro station is very important. But if if it's not a mobility hub, it's, it's not a, a network function at the proximity, use opportunities, talk with no local economy, with the local shops, and you will see it but don't use a box a checkbox tick 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 no just talk and, and observe there is one question that goes in a similar direction um so pablo asked um if you have mobility hubs that are not connected to tram lines so the question also of uh, public transport connection do you think that is a, an absolute absolute must or do you think there's also why mobility hubs must not be connected to any other public transport solutions. Maybe again, to Angela, uh, I can jump into that one. So only our large stations, those 10 large stations that I mentioned, the Mobilpunkte or so-called network hubs, are connected to public transport. Um, those are more, I would say, more centralized locations um, where several bus and tram lines come together. Um, and those are the larger hubs. Um, that feature larger and also specialty vehicles like a nine-seater van or a um, you know a cargo um, transporter. Um, those are the types of vehicles that um, people don't need on a daily basis, and that they're willing to travel a little little bit further for. Um, but that should should be easily accessible, and that tram and bus connection makes it easily accessible. Um, the mobile the smaller stations, are really in the neighborhoods. Um, where the journey starts, you know, for those daily trips, um, those are really intended to replace the private um, car for daily trips, um, and those are usually smaller, more compact vehicles, um, at most a, a station wagon. So it's mm -hmm. not absolutely essential. Um, it really depends on what type of journey um, you're planning for and what kind of um, user needs you're you're planning for. Mm -hmm. Angelo, did you want to add or? Um, it's better to, if you connect it to tram lines to, to public transport stops, but if the public transport stop is too far, then it's better a mobility hub without public transport than no, no mobility hub. So like okay. having access close by at walking distance to shared mobility, it's better than having only access to your own car. Mm -hmm. Your answer brings me to the next question I have here because it's, it's uh, directed at the question of you know space usage in cities. So uh, Rohit asks, how is space being managed if we are creating these mobi hubs in a city area? Do we have different size plans according to different locations? Uh, I think uh, Rebecca, you mentioned that also in terms of uh, the infrastructure you try to provide with the different hubs, and then of course the distinction between the uh, mobile function and mobile punta. Yeah. Um, also, it's it's something Angelo also mentioned is looking at opportunities that are that are available. Um, one side looking at the need need side for what mobility services and how the neighborhood is structured, um, what kind of users there are. 
but also what opportunities. Um, in Bremen, we're mostly planning in dense urban neighborhoods, um, and we've been really successful with our um, network of smaller, more compact hubs, um, and especially combining those with infrastructure uh, improvements, because then we get the local political support for doing something extra for the neighborhood. Um, so, um, yeah, managing the space sometimes, um, of course, it would be nice to have the opportunity to do more larger hubs, um, but sometimes it's the compromise of um, accomplishing something in the space that you have uh, available and yeah, making something more of it and improving the, the neighborhood structure in general. So again, I love your answers because they keep uh, making me know which questions to select because um, Maxime from Lviv actually asks both of you if you have identified any opponents, so people or organizations of mobility hubs in your respective city or regions. So it sounded like Rebecca, like you had some encounters with uh, politicians or citizens who were not so fond of maybe a new mobile punkt in their area. Um, sure. Um, it's. I mean, it's been a long process. We've been planning mobile puncture for 17 years now um, and promoting car sharing for, for quite a long time. And um, now we're at a point in the discussion that it's no longer about if it's a good idea um, or not, but where. And sometimes the where leads to discussion. Um, and sometimes neighborhood politicians think the idea of a mobile punkt is really great. Um, and they also come um, to us with, with suggestions. Um, but sometimes when it gets very concrete, and maybe there's some, you know, one very loud negative voice from the neighborhood, um, they, um, yeah, they withdraw from, from their decision. Um, that hasn't happened uh, in a long time because we invest a lot of um, effort in um, engaging stakeholders from a very early stage and, um, you know, using the psychology of involving them, you know, suggesting an idea to them, asking where they would think based on the cr criteria that I mentioned would be a good site and having those local politicians on board um, and making them think it was their idea. And, and then essentially it is, I mean, it's a, it's a joint process. Um, and when they back the idea 100%, then they are more willing to withstand this, um, you know, negative win that sometimes comes from the public. Because then, the, yeah, the negative voices are sometimes loud, but they're rarely ever the majority and they're given a lot of power. Um, and those loud voices die down um, really quickly after the change has happened, because mostly it's not the idea that's the problem, it's simply the change that is the problem. And um, I'm always surprised at how much emotional value is placed on a parking space in the public realm, but it can get really heated. And um, some people think seem to think it is their, their parking space and their right um, you know, to park there all the time, whenever they want, and that we're taking something away from them. But if we can, you know, do the, the legwork uh, in advance, um, also communicate about why we're doing um, the activity, what we expect the impact to be, um, and just be really transparent, um, that works really well. Um, a few years ago, I started writing to every single household in, in the streets um, that are affected by the planning. And um, that's been proven really successful. So last year I wrote to 5,000 households and I got two nasty letters. What, one, what, one called me an eco-dictator, which, which is, I've, no, I've never been so flattered. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good quote on your side, I have to say. It is, a, sure it is a very good, good quote. Yeah, so being, being yeah. transparent, being open about what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, and if you have the resources to do public consultations and um, like in, in Bergen and Norway, they often really sit down with the neighborhood initiatives and plant hubs together, which is a really great um, approach. Um, I don't have the resources to do that uh, in Bremen, but the least I can do is really communicate very transparently and on a personal level of why the city is doing this. And um, yeah, there, I mean, there's always going to be opponents in transport planning. Um, you can never make everybody happy, but um, taking those concerns seriously um, is uh, has yeah proven to be really effective for planning mobility hubs. And I think uh, most of our participants know uh, how difficult or how 
uh, complicated it can get if you're planning mobility in cities and you're starting to touch parking space. So I think there's a lot of understanding for your position among the participants. Um, Angelo, I'd like to give you a question from Timothy. Uh, he's, he asked, what are these kiosks and digital pillars on MobiHubs for? Isn't it simpler and cheaper to just make a smartphone app as an intermodal mobility platform? Um, it would be cheaper, uh, but we don't. If you use a smartphone, you use it to search something you really want to search for. And with the digital pillar, people are waiting at the hub and they have time and they just want to see, try something. And they didn't know car sharing, but they are there and they want to try car and they want to see what does it mean. So you achieve more on that. Also, um, still, uh, of, of course, you know it, but there are people not having smartphones or not having access to internet. Even it's better to offer Wi-Fi also at the, at the mobility hub. So that's one of the additional services So for them also. But we still believe that it's useful. And it's also like a landmark. Um, so, okay, you can, make, don't, you can choose for a landmark, which is not digital neither. But if you create a landmark, making it digital isn't that expensive. And you can even add other kind of information, like um, information about cultural activities in the neighborhood. Everything can be made tailor-made. What we don't do is we don't, as an organization, we don't want to create commercial information. You can choose for that, but that's not what you want to do. But that kind of information from the neighborhood, which is not commercial, but useful for everyone. You can do everything with it. It's very flexible. Mm -hmm. um, that actually uh, connects to the question that Nathaniel posted, because he asked um, if Mobi Ponds indi are indicated on maps, so let's say on something like Google Maps, or if you can just find them in, in a dedicated app. Um, of course, uh, today we don't have the critical mass to make it useful for Google Maps, but we have chosen uh, for our Mobi Point, point, uh, points in the mobile hubs in Belgium, a logo which is an, uh, a pointer from Google. It looks like a pointer with the letter M in it. And it's really to make it, co to connect the physical world with the digital world. So we hope to, to, to achieve that. And in our mobile hub database, it's a plan to create an API. And then, of course, everyone can use this information. And we want to use a standard, a European standard. So what we are doing, maybe in Germany, maybe in France, that everyone is doing the same things. And maybe Google, maybe someone else can create, uh, use this info. That's what we want to hope to achieve. Mm -hmm. Here's another interesting question from uh, Manisha. And I think uh, it was posted when Rebecca was giving her presentation. She asked, how does mobility hubs promote walking? Could it have been that you've mentioned something like this, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. um, all of the mobility hubs in, in Bremen are located in areas that you can walk to. You know, they, they are accessible on foot and, and by bicycle. Um, it's never something that you have to be in a car or a vehicle to, to access. It should always be on a neighborhood scale and easy to access and, and walk to um for for anybody um we also know that the users um of the mobility hubs and the users of of car sharing that they walk and and cycle much more than the average car owner because the the car perhaps you know it's um car use becomes a rational decision um when you are a car sharing user you decide really do i need a car for this particular journey and often the answer in the city is no um, in a city with good, you know, walking and cycling infrastructure. Um, so in general, the shared mobility services um, support those active transport modes um, because they give a different level of flexibility um, versus versus the private car. And simply the decision making process of what mode of transport um, to use, yeah, shifts away from from the private privately owned car. Mm -hmm. From our side, if I may, so we really promote it directly. So we have in our analog pillars, um, we, we have a map with every hotspot in the neighborhood at walkable distance. And we add, okay, and it's walking to the post. So for us, it's an as important mode as cycling. And we integrate it in the digital maps and in uh, the, the non-digital pillars. So. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, interesting aspect that I think we haven't really discussed uh, throughout the day so far. Um, I have another question here for you from Maxime again. Do you agree that mobility hub that mobility hubs are a key aspect and more a top-down approach of e-mobility development through promoting sharing behavior first and step-by-step -step mobility electrification secondly? Rebecca, how do you feel about that? Um, I mean, yes, I mean, obviously, um, the mobility services can definitely facilitate um, the proliferation of, of e-mobility. Um, it you know it gives people access to um, to electric vehicles, um, and I think one of the you know, most important aspects of, of using EVs is, is to try it out. Um, and I think there are certainly some shared mobility operators that, especially car share operators, that are um, thinking of a new business case and getting people to try and then you know buy electric vehicles, um, especially if they're backed by large um, automobile. Uh, companies, but um, again, as as a city, it's it's not our main, you know, focus um, to promote uh, electric mobility. It's always um, that sharing aspect is most important to us, um, rather than the the propulsion type. Um, and it it doesn't have to lead to you know the purchase of of a of an EV. We are more interested in people sharing vehicles rather than owning private vehicles, whether they're diesel, gasoline, or electric. Now that the street scene that I showed you of the too many cars on, on both sides, that will look exactly the same if those are all electric vehicles. It will look exactly the same if they're all, um, um, now what's, what's Wasserstoff in, in English? Um, hydrogen. Hydrogen, thank you. <laughs> and, and they all look the same if they're all privately owned autonomous cars. So um, it's the only that, uh, that sharing aspect that to us as a city is most important. Mm -hmm. Angelo, did you have similar experiences in your work? Um, yes, I really believe in um, the transportation parents. So for us, most important is walking, cycling, that public transport, that the use of shared vehicles and then vehicles, then electric, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I believe in this hierarchy. But um, it doesn't mean that f that you have to first convince everyone to walk and then the next step uh, convince everyone to use a bicycle. You can combine things also. So there are priorities, but it doesn't mean that you cannot promote electric cars. Sometimes it's maybe better to have an electric shared car than a non-electric shared car. But see, but be aware of the impact of that. So. So try to combine, but be, be smart. Electric mobility doesn't solve any problem. So, so pyramid is very important for me, but use it in a smart way. Mm -hmm. So here I have an even uh, more futuristic question from Alex from, from Accra in Ghana, actually. He's asking, um, are there options for providing self-driving vehicles at mobility hubs? If yes, how is such a scheme managed and the user damages and anything on the vehicle? Do you have any first uh, ideas or visions for including self-driving cars in mobility hubs? Angelo, because you have a whole network? So I have no experiences. So I, I've, I've, I've seen experiences with small uh, self-driving buses, but okay, until what I've seen are pilots, it's nothing real. So, but of course, if you really, if you are really going to a future with electric cars, you can really create those hubs of shared vehicles outside the city center. So that kind of things, it's it's useful to organize. Sometimes, if you think how could the future look like with uh, autonomous cars, you can already already look to uh, the United States and Uber because Uber driver and the system of Uber Pool looks a little bit what it might be like uh, with autonomous cars. And then it's what I've shown in my slide. Just be aware that it's it's still car usage. Um, sharing is better than individual usage, but uh, public transport, cycling is better. So don't I don't don't be focused too much on this technology, but see it in the whole picture and the whole transport uh, spectrum. Yeah. And Rebecca, I'm assuming because in Germany there isn't really uh, legal grounds for uh, 
autonomous vehicles yet, or is is it something you're piloting anyways, or maybe even looking into? It's it's not something we're piloting um, for for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, we are, are working on a European project to, together with Taxi Stuff uh, on autonomous and automated transport called Art Forum, um, where we deal with policy questions um, around autonomous transport. Um, and I know you know it's quite clear in the shared mobility world, um, promoting shared mobility now is paving the way or will pave the way for shared autonomous transport in the future. Um, you know, those are behavior types that we have to encourage now, this um, awareness and acceptance of sharing vehicles if we want to see a future of shared electric autonomous vehicles. Um, otherwise, we'll have business as usual and autonomous cars and even more, more cars in cities and more empty trips. Um, at the moment, we're not planning on them at mobility hubs because, I mean, the reality of the matter in autonomous driving is that um, it is highly unlikely that we will see something like that in such a complex urban environment um, like the city city of Bremen um, in the next 30, 40 years. Um, I just don't see it. Um, obviously, a lot is being worked on by the industry, um, and there are certain um, use cases where it works quite well, and also obviously in segregated systems um, for public transport. Um, this is really, really e efficient way of the people you think of, you know, the, the subway system in Copenhagen. Um, but like Angelo said, everything else is really much at a very early pilot stage um, and only works well in segregated lines. So um, in a complex urban environment where you have pedestrians, cyclists, um, buses, trams, private cars, um, everything, it's, it's um, not a realistic use case. Um, and that's why we're not considering it at mobi mobility hubs. Uh, in a dense urban network. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting close to the finish line for our session, but allow me to uh, address you with two more questions. Because uh, Jana asks if there is any approximate average cost, so on the side of the city council investment, per mobility hub or mobile point. Have there been any comparisons done between savings from climate change, clean air, public health, or other perspectives in relation to the actual cost that you're facing in the city? Maybe for Bremen again, the question? Yeah, um, I can say uh, on average investment um, for Mobilpunkt is about fi uh, 5,000 euros per parking space. Um, that kind of gives it dimension. Um, so it's we, we really set on you know low-tech um, solutions. Um, you know, for the for the cost of of one digital pillar, um, I can plan and design three mobile punkte, and that's why we focus on that. So, um, the yeah, the average cost is about five thousand euros per parking space, and that includes you know the average cost of signage and 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 marking um, and the planning, the larger you get. Um, the calculations we've done is um, compared to um, the impact. Of, of that hub, uh, of each hub on private car ownership. Um, and the cost um, that we would have as a city if we were to build municipal parking garages to, you know, to store that number of vehicles. Um, the, the average cost of, of a parking space to build a parking space, um, you know, in a parking garage in Bremen is between 20 and 45,000 euros. So for a small investment of 10,000 euros for maybe a mobile function with two parking bays. Um, we can replace 30 privately owned cars or get 30 privately owned cars off the street. If we had to build a parking garage, you know, to get those 30 privately owned cars off the street simply by moving in the parking garage, it would be an investment of hundreds of thousands of euros. Um, so I think, I mean, CO2 calculations and that it's it's important that we know that has a positive climate impact, but um, when you argue from an economic side, um, there's often quite m much more convincing um, to certain um, skeptics. Uh, like for instance, I had, a, I had a, a, a nasty letter from the Taxpayers Association a few years ago. And with the simple calculation of, you know, what we would save on taxpayer money if we had to build a parking garage versus the investment in a small mobility hub, um, that was really effective. Um, and I, I never heard from them again, which is great. 
Angelo, is there anything you can add maybe also on the question of um, including bike or e-bike sharing into mobility hubs in terms of costs? This is a, a very difficult question to, to to answer in a simple way. So, of course, I think I can recommend to organize workshops uh, for your own organization or a Tume in general about those business cases. And now that autodealing.net, our partner organization, is Shenorte for the mobility apps and Advir, another organization, are really good in those business cases of um integrating shared mobility into new city developments or housing developments so it always makes sense it's really if you see those numbers then your your eyes start to produce dollar signs so it's really it's always a good investment um in investing in cycling i'm not an expert on that but i know that it's always much less than investing in space for cars so it's all i, I, re, I really believe that it's a good choice in shared mobility using yeah, we, we have replaced more than uh, I, almost 20,000 carping, carping places in Belgium. If, you, if everyone knows that its own city, how much it costs, then you know that it's really a lot of money. So, so much you can do with it for cycling, but for, our, for developing other things also. Mm -hmm. And then the final question for both of you, because I think it's, it's a quite interesting one. Um, do you consider special needs like baby seats, um, wheelchair space, or even the needs of the mobility of care? Rebecca, I know you talked about already how you're designing infrastructure to make sure you have some tactical elements in there. Is this something that's also included in the cars or the areas that are dedicated to becoming the hub? Yeah, um, so, the largest car share provider in, in Bremen is Cambio, um, and it's also active in, in Belgium. Um, and they have a, a child seat in every car, or um, you know, a bit over near every car. So the, all the, the um, vehicles are family friendly. And say, and that's also how um, you know when, when we tender to, to find a car share provider to operate the hubs. That's one aspect that we select for is this like family friendly services. Um, we also look for barrier free vehicles so they get you know additional points if they are, um, offer handicap accessible vehicles um, we don't have any of those in Bremen yet but um, the automatic transmission is already one step in the right direction um, some people with some um, physical impairments um, find driving a, a um, an automatic transmission uh, much much easier but um, Cambio Belgium has has some really great examples uh, in Ghent Oh. Yes, we, we have, <laughs> but for um, every mobility hub, you can add many, many different services, but you cannot add everything at every mobility hub. So what we promote is that is talk with the neighborhood, try to understand the needs of every neighborhood, and then maybe you can add for this specific target group this. And what we want to do in with our organization is share this experience with other municipalities. And it can inspire other municipalities. And maybe it's a great idea, but it doesn't work at all. But it's really great that they have tried this idea. And we are bringing those learning experiences from one hub to another hub, from one city to another city or another country. So, and okay, there are specific needs for specific target groups. And I think it's very important to, to, to think inclusive. Uh, but you cannot serve everyone, but maybe try to do it and learn and um for elderly for 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 families for whatever sometimes it works sometimes not but the best thing is to start to think about the target groups because we have five minutes left i'm going to give you one last question and maybe you can just give me really quick answers on what your first idea of this is because manisha asked how does the idea of mobility hubs differ from a car sharing app I didn't understand the question, sorry. Please. So Manisha has asked a little bit of a provocative question because she asked, how does the idea of mobility hubs differ from simple car sharing as we have in many cities via an app already? We can have, mobility, we can have mobility hubs without car sharing even. So it's, um, we started to, we were inspired by Bremen and in Bremen it started more like car sharing stations that became bigger than car sharing stations. We've learned that and we started to promote uh, the idea of hubs uh, with always different modes without hierarchy. 
Um, so this is as important as that. So and even now we've learned later on that it can work without um, car sharing. The only thing we want to achieve is what can we offer to people in a neighborhood or, or where they live, or where they work, that is an alternative of car ownership. And if you can offer the alternative by adding certain services, it doesn't matter what kind of services, it's for us a mobility hub. So this is the idea, idea behind, an alternative, reliable alternative to ownership. So, and okay. often it's like a station, but sometimes not. Mm -hmm. And exactly for us in Bremen, um, it's all about the alternative to the privately owned car. And for us, that always includes um, car sharing and mobility hubs. But it's a mobility hub because of the branding, the location, and the other services it's it's combined with. Um, otherwise, you know, the standard car share station is in a parking garage. It's in a back lot with some cars, and that's it, which is important. But the mobility hub is, as I mentioned, drawing it into the public realm, public awareness, making it more attractive and combining it with services so that it really becomes a viable alternative to private car ownership. Perfect. I think those are the ideal last words for today's session. Rebecca and Angelo, I want to thank you so much that you took the time so late in the evening to join us and make it possible for participants all around the world to join. I know there's some people on here in Asia, it's 2.30 in the morning for them and they are still online. So thanks so much um, for giving us much. Um, and we'll be happy, of course, uh, to, if there's some more pressing questions from participants, I might uh, redirect some of them to you afterwards. Um, and if you have the time, it would be wonderful if you give us a quick reply. Otherwise, uh, we look forward to having you again at one of our TUMI events. And uh, for now, I want to close the session and uh, give everyone a well-deserved uh, Feierabend, as we say in Germany. And uh, I hope to see the participants again tomorrow. Uh, but for tonight, thank you so much for joining our evening lecture on e-mobility hubs. Okay, it was a thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Have a great few days. So. Yep. Enjoy. Good night. Bye bye.